And now we come to the idea of active participation. And it's important that as we talk about active participation, we go back to the source. Where does this come from? Well, it comes the first time that the church ever really mentions active participation uh, by the faithful is in 1903 with Pope Pius X. He's the first one to mention this idea. And I think it's incredible over the 1900 year history of uh, the Catholic Church to consider that this was the first time that it was deemed necessary to encourage active participation. And this is, um, it gets codified from 1903 until um, the Second Vatican Council, more and more popes will talk about the idea of active participation. It's also important to remember that 1903, the document that Pope Pius X issues, his motu proprio, tra le solicitudini, is a culmination of the work that had begun with Don Guéranger and the monks of Salem Abbey. If you remember way back when we talked about the monks of Salem and uh, Don Guéranger, and what they were trying to do was um, essentially pray better. <laughs> if it come down to the, comes down to brass tacks, they wanted to pray better as they were reforming their monastery following the French Revolution. And they started to look at sources for Gregorian chant, and they started researching sources for Gregorian chant. And, and they had done a lot of work leading up to 1903. So this document that Pope Pius X puts out really is a culmination of their work and many others' uh, work as well. Uh, various societies in the church trying to reform uh, liturgical music. Because by the 19th century, uh, it had gotten pretty bad. Um, in the 19th century, you had a lot of church music that was just not very good, for the most part, in many areas of the church. Uh, and the way it impacted in the United States um, depended upon the immigrant group that was coming in. If you were Irish, which many uh, immigrants, uh, Catholic immigrants, were from Ireland, there wasn't much music at all. If you were from Italy, it, there was a lot of singing, but that singing was not of the best quality. If you were from a Germanic-speaking land, a lot of that was Lutheran-style hymns that had come into the church. So the idea of active participation in the church, what are the forms or the physical signs of active participation? We have genuflections, you have the sign of the cross, the shaking of hands or the at the sign of peace, uh, singing of course, and spoken responses. And then there are internal signs, and that is when the heart and the mind are raised to God. And engaged. When we get to the Second Vatican Council, it really did promote the idea of active participation of the laity. And this is clear in the Sacrosanctum Concilium. And what it called for was beyond just active participation. It was full, active, and conscious participation. The Latin expression participatio actuosa has two different views. The first being that the congregation uh, does not participate unless they're singing. So that's like singing equals participation. The second being that the internal attitude is the way of um, participating, turning one's heart and mind uh, to God. So is it external or is it internal? These are kind of extreme views. So now let's talk about Another document, this document is called Musicum Sacrum, and this is essentially the practical application of Sacrosanctum Concilium. So the sixth chapter of that the dogmatic constitution on the sacred liturgy is about music, right? And it gives some principles. Musicum Sacrum is basically putting those principles into practice. And in that document, it uh, talks about participation, that it should be above all internal and in the sense that it by the faithful join their mind to what they pronounce, hear, and cooperate with heavenly grace. So uh, I've shared this 
uh, photo with you in class before. This I took uh, on Epiphany 2020 at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, where we had um, the music, music was um, Haydn's, Joseph Haydn's uh, Mass in Time of War, or the Pauken Mass, the Timpani Mass. And I snapped this photograph of the lady uh, who was sitting next to me because every time the orchestra and choir sang a part of the Mass, she was fully into it, as were many other people in the church, being very attentive in heart and mind. We weren't singing, uh, but as you can see from this photo, she was fully involved in the prayer. Again, Musicum Sacrum also says it must be, on the other hand, external also. So you can't just have internal, are we just an audience? But it must be external also so that the faithful might show the uh, internal participation by gestures and attitudes, acclamations, responses, and singing. So it's important not just to have one kind of um, participation, that which is internal, but it also must, the external must reflect what's happening on the internal. It's also said that the lady should unite their minds and hearts with what is being spoken or sung in order to connect with God. And again, uh, I was very, very moved by the attitude of this lady and many other people in the congregation. So what are the driving forces in congregational singing? Well, one is, of course, people's desire to praise God with music and song. Um, I know there's a lot of people who go to church who don't necessarily want to sing. Uh, many of them probably come to church because they feel some kind of obligation. Uh, and that's not bad. Uh, as a cantor, I stand in front of people and I, when I see people not singing, I think to myself, do you not have the joy in your hearts to praise God today? Or maybe do you have some kind of pain in your life that it's too difficult for you to join in singing? Because that's also the possible you know, reason as well. Then there's another driving force, and that is sometimes clergy who unwittingly limit congregational singing. I have to tell you that it's been on many occasions that a priest will say, oh, let's not sing the blank part of Mass. Um, oftentimes it's the Gloria or maybe the Eucharistic acclamations or something to that effect, you know, to get things moving along. And oftentimes I think to myself, why don't you leave out your homily? <laughs> because then we're just listening. Why take away a part of the Mass that clearly is the people's to be singing? or to be spoken. Uh, I think that's a very important consideration. So the acclamations and responses also need to be easy to learn and to encourage participation. And this creates a problem as well. So easy enough for people who are not musicians to sing, but then interesting enough to keep our interest, musicians' interests, but also the people's interests. If it's too simple, it, um, it isn't inspiring. So I think that's, you know, it, it's not an, a black or white situation, but something that has to be judged um, by the pastoral um, musical uh, director. So should participation be external or internal? Really, it's a combination of both. The external part of the Mass is supposed to be a representation of what is being felt by the individual as the Mass proceeds. And the internal uh, should join your hearts and minds to God. There's also a need to show that what is being experienced by the person inside in order to communicate with the surrounding congregation. If you've ever been to um, an African American congregation, a lot of times the people in the congregation will shout back during a, during a, a sermon by the preacher or a homily by the, uh, the pastor or deacon uh, where they will, you know, they'll tell, they'll encourage the preacher um, by their own acclamations, you know, preach it or, you know, some other kind of way. Um, less so in 
the general American culture, uh, white American culture, where you don't usually see those kinds of things. Um, but there is that kind of need to kind of express that um, regardless. Um, so the author uses uh, his experience of mass at St. Mark's Basilica in Venice as a case study. And I had the opportunity to go to St. Mark's Basilica two years ago, two or three years ago, for the Feast of the Epiphany. Uh, and what I found there was probably one of the most inspiring things I'd ever experienced in my life. And, you know, I knew that the author had written about this, but I had never experienced it myself. I had a similar experience to this at the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake City, Utah. You think Salt Lake City is not synonymous with Catholicism. It's mostly synonymous with the headquarters of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. But I had a very similar experience between St. Mark's Basilica and Venice and the, the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake City. So let's talk a little bit about that case study which the author uses and my own experience. So there is a lack of Lutheran-style hymn singing there. Uh, and I did notice that the Mass can be beautiful without them. There's, I wouldn't say no loss of active participation. Uh, I don't know how to put that, but I guess maybe that's the way of saying it. I, I was fully engaged with it. The people around me seemed to be as well. Um, and they had polyphony. There was plain chant. Uh there was hymn singing, but it wasn't the Lutheran style singing. Um, so what does the music at St. Mark's Basilica look like? So here are all the musical elements of the Mass that, from my own experience of being there. And you can read through those various things. And I put whether or not the congregation was singing or the congregation was listening or whether the congregation was listening and responding. So take a look at the ones that are um, just singing. You've got the introit, the credo, the Our Father, and a hymn of thanksgiving after communion. And then if you look at the, the places where the people are listening, it's just those parts, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Offertory, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, and the communion, where we're listening. And I might add, it was overwhelmingly beautiful the first time that I heard it there. Part of the reason why it's so beautiful in St. Mark's Basilica is that the acoustic uh, with all the golden domes inside are very reverberant and warm the sound in a way that I had not heard before. And I had been to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome for Mass with the Pope just a couple of days prior to going to this. And I found that the music in St. Mark's Basilica was actually much better than my experience at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, in Vatican City. And then finally, the parts of the Mass where there is listening and responding. And there's quite a few of those. Responsorial Psalm, the prayer, the acclamation, the Amen, the preface dialogue. So I have prepared for uh, the class to watch some clips that I took while I was at Mass at St. Mark's Basilica. Again, I believe this is uh, Epiphany 2018, so January 6th, 2018 in St. Mark's. And I encourage you to watch all of the elements of... Some of it's not so great because you aren't really allowed to take video there. Um, but I will leave you a link to watch the um, the Mass. Um yeah, it's, forgive the, the bad video quality, but uh, hopefully you can appreciate the sound as much as possible. And so in conclusion, compromise is the best between external and internal participation because both can be active. So you'll get a good compromise musically, and liturgically and theologically. Because if you think theologically, um, from the beginning of John's gospel, it starts out, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, right? And if the in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, Jesus is the Word, one has to listen first 
to the word. And so this idea theologically between internal and external, it makes sense that we're going to be listening and responding, listening first and responding second. The Mass at St. Mark's Basilica, and I'd say there are, you know, many other churches where you could find this. Um, as I mentioned, the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake City was also quite beautiful. Um, and the different kinds of participation. There are multitude of examples of this in papal masses as the Pope, um, be it uh, John Paul II or Benedict XVI or Francis, as they travel the world and as you, uh, if you can look online and see some papal masses, you'll see the people responding in their own culture, in their own time and place, what is important to them, be it through dance sometimes, or through their own indigenous musics, or through hand clapping, or some other uh, gesture that they might have. To me, that is really inspiring. And uh, I saw a mass from Pope Francis, uh, it was from Mozambique, in the fall of 2019, that was really quite moving to watch the people and be so excited to celebrate with uh, Pope Francis. Anyway, that is the end of today's lecture on active participation. Thank you.